Hey guys, all right, we're gonna come back with a little bit of a teaching video here, and this might be what could be regarded as an apologetics video. We're gonna deal with three of the major pieces of scripture that are uh, often trotted out from the New Testament as a rebuttal for any polygyny argument or any argument about a man having more than one wife. Now, I have covered all of these in previous videos, so certainly some of you have seen a good bit of this material before, maybe spread out in different places or in slightly different forms. But the bottom line is, right now, I've got so many people who want to say things in the comments and they want to keep bringing up exactly the same uh, verses, and I get tired of explaining exactly the same verses every single time, you know, and having to say it over and over because people aren't interested in reading the rest of the comments or going and watching something else or searching for it. So we're going to make one video that deals with all three of the major objections that come out of the New Testament. And with that, then we should have a tool that we can put in people's hands that uh, addresses all of those in one place once the conversation has already been opened up about what Scripture says with regards to a man having more than one wife. So we're going to deal with three passages of Scripture. We're going to deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, and that is the each man have his own wife and each wife have her own husband. We're going to deal with 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and Titus chapter 1, verse 6. That's elder or deacon should be the husband of one wife. And we're going to deal with Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, and the passage where Yeshua refers to um, creation as he tries to, or as he is making a statement with regards to a question the Pharisees asked him about uh, putting away and sometimes mistranslated as divorced. So, those three, buckle your seatbelt, here we go. Okay, guys, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at three passages of Scripture, and uh, I'm going to try to make this fairly quick. We want, to, we want to be able to dive through these pretty quickly in order to demonstrate that this is not a complicated argument. It does take a little bit of understanding, and it helps to uh, have some study tools to look into what the original languages said. Uh, or what they say, I should say, because we still have the scriptures in the original languages, and every person is to study to show themselves approved uh, workmen unto God who need not be ashamed. So first place that we want to go is we want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and often what is commonly brought out is this single verse that says, But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. And of course, in the English, that looks like, oh, look, that's one man, one woman, right? That's what it says, huh? So let's take a look at what the, what the verse actually says in the Greek, okay? Because remember, the Bible wasn't written in English, and it wasn't written to Americans or to Western civilization. It was written in, uh, this portion of the Bible was written in Greek, and uh, the words have specific meanings, okay? We're going to look particularly at two words. We're going to look at this word own right here and own right here, okay? So the word shows up in there twice, right? So let's go to uh, the tools, and we're going to pull it up interlinear and take a look at this verse right quick. So down the left-hand column right here, uh, and the tool that I'm using here is Blue Letter Bible. I strongly encourage you if, you, if you have never done any studying of the Bible and really taken a hard look at things, I would encourage you to learn how to use this tool. It's not hard. The simple initial uses are going to be to be able to search words and phrases or to look up things in different language or, or different translations and compare translations. And then the next step is to learn how to use Strong's words uh, or Strong's numbers and identify the definition 
uh, or deeper meanings of words, what what they actually mean. Okay, so when I when I clicked on tools right here next to the verse or the verse itself, it opens up this suite of options, and we're going through interlinear, and we're going to scroll down. On, in the left-hand column, it has the English word, it has the Strong's number, and then what the transliteration is. This may or may not be of importance. What we really want to know is what the Strong's number is and then be able to look that word up in other places and how it gets used. So we're going to scroll down. Because of immoralities, each man is to have his own, right here, his own wife, okay? So this word right here is he'atu, okay? He'atu, and I want you to remember that, he'atu, it's 1438. If you need to, you can, you can write that down real quick. It's uh, G 1438, because we're going to keep reading the verse. I'm going to show you something interesting before we get started. So wife and each woman to have her own. Here's the other own, and that doesn't look like 1432. That looks like 2398, and that does not look like he'atu. That looks like idios different word entirely okay sometimes you'll have different you know the same word that's got a different ending suffix or prefix or whatever that kind of thing that's not what's going on here this is entire two entirely different words that have both been translated as own so we need to look at these very quickly so this this word own right here what we're gonna do hey I too we're gonna look this up first and this word right here means that he has exclusive ownership of her. She belongs to him. This is exactly what we expect, and it's the way that, uh, that modern Christendom translates it. They translate this one correctly, okay? She belongs to him. She is, to actually use the, the proper terminology all the way through Scripture, um, that we see from beginning to end, she belongs to him. She is his property, okay? Um, very much in the, in the setting where, for example, in all of the Old Testament, there's no such word as wife. It always means the woman of Abraham, Sarah, the woman of, or his woman, um, Rebecca, you know, Isaac's woman, Rebecca. It's always in the possessive. She belongs to him exclusively. That's what this word is all about, okay? So we're not going to dig into this real deep simply because... Um, it's only going to confirm what Christendom already agrees with, okay? What we want to do is we want to look at the other word here that says own, and each woman is to have her own, right here, see this right here? Each woman is to have her own, idios, husband, idios. Huh, so let's see what this word means, because both of these words have been translated as own. The question is, does it mean the same thing as heatu? Okay, so if we scroll down here, we can scroll down pertaining to oneself or belonging to one's self. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, good place to start. Let's look at some uses of this word. Okay, everywhere that, so it, it has listed all the verses where this word shows up. Getting into a boat, Yeshua, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. Did he belong to the city? Or, um, or, or did the city belong to him, or did was he one of many that belonged to the city? Right, uh, the city wasn't his property. Uh, yes, this is my city. Thank you very much. No, um, he was one of many who lived in that city, and that was the city that he, you know, lived in. That he belonged to. He belonged to that city. So we're going to look at a couple more examples down through here that say, you know, very similar things. For example, let's go down here to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at verse 14. Uh, for it is uh, just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves. Well, we recognize it's multiple slaves that all belong to the one man. They are corporately his possession, his property, okay? trusted his possessions to them as an example let's scroll on down here i want to look at uh some of these other examples don't show up quite as clearly but i want to show you some very clear ones he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him okay so it's a one to many ownership he owns many 
okay, those who were his own. It's in fact the those right there is in the plural, just like slaves in the previous uh, previous verse is in the plural, okay. So John chapter four verse forty four. For Yeshua himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Does the country belong to the prophet, or does the prophet is the prophet one of many that belongs to the country? It's a one-to-many relationship. The, this this word is used that way over and over and over through Scripture. John chapter ten verse three: To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He's not talking about one sheep, right? His own sheep is not a singular sheep. That's a plural. It's a plurality. It's a one-to-many relationship, okay? One-to-many relationship. Here we go, John 10, verse 12. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep. It's a one-to-many relationship. One-to-many relationship. We'll see this again. Uh, Let's just take one more here down in Acts chapter 13. Uh, Acts 13, 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of Elohim in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. This is the same word, again, translated as own, but did David, did the whole generation belong to David or was David part of a generation? He was one of many that belonged to that generation. Okay, so we see this over and over again. And uh, this is exactly the circumstance in this 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 verse that, quite frankly, is translated poorly, mostly because we don't understand or the translators had a monogamy-only bias. They had lenses on where they couldn't see what Scripture actually says and don't even recognize that right here Paul is very clearly leaving the door open for polygyny by choosing two different words. He could easily have said his own um, uh, his own wife with Heatu and then each woman to have her own Heatu husband, which would have been a singular possessive ownership. But not such is not the case. He was very intentional in choosing a different word to write right there. Uh, it's unfortunate that the English language translates them both the same, but they do not mean the same thing. A better rendering of this verse would be, because of immoralities, each man is to possess um, his woman, and each woman is to be possessed by a man, okay? Meaning more than one woman can belong to a man. The same same circumstance, more than one slave can belong to a master, or more than one servant can belong to a master, or more than one person can belong to a city. Every one of these is the way that works. So that's the quick and, quick and simple for 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. It lays that one to rest. We can, uh, we can uh, tap that one out and move on to the next one. Uh, so the second one that we want to take a look at, or the second common objection that we hear, is First Timothy chapter three, verse two. Look at that; it's in the queue. So we're going to go ahead and pull that up. First Timothy chapter three, verse two, and this says something very similar to First uh, or to Titus one, uh, chapter one, verse six. So here we go. An overseer then must be above reproach, and an overseer here. Um, is actually a servant that takes care of, but he must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine uh, or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. And it's important for us to read the next verse because this plays into an understanding. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity with all dignity. Okay, so uh, the the point that we want to look at here is we're going to look at this one wife because everybody says, see, 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 um, you can't have, because you're a teacher, you can only have one wife. Well, is that really what this says? Okay, so the first thing that we should do before we even go look at the word itself is we should put on our thinking caps and go, let's see, 
Uh, an elder, Paul is telling us that an elder uh, or an overseer, actually, this isn't even a presbyter. Uh, let's see, what is the word here? I don't think it is um, episkopos, okay? Um, not, not a presbyter, elder, but episkopos, okay? An overseer, then, is to have one um, husband of one wife. So here's the first question that we should ask. Uh, is Paul able to write a standard that no other, you know, that Abraham can't meet or that Jacob can't meet or that Moses can't meet? Uh, David, one wife, that would disqualify David. He can't even be a, an overseer in some small little congregation in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and yet he could write scripture. He was a man after God's own heart. He's written as a man approved by God in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses, who wrote the Torah, uh, who led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. Um, he uh, was a man that saw God face to face on multiple occasions. Um, I, I contend it was the angel of the Lord or Yeshua. Uh, that's a different conversation, but it's, it, it's very demonstrable from Scripture. I can prove that all over and over. But here's the point. Are we saying that those guys, that now Paul is saying those guys are not qualified to lead a small congregation? I, uh, I pastored two churches for 10 years. And the combined congregation between two different churches, these were little tiny country churches in the middle of nowhere, um, the combined congregation sometimes would gust all the way up to about 30 people um, between two congregations. And they had two elders, if I'm not mistaken, one elder in each congregation. Uh, but Moses wouldn't qualify to be an elder in that congregation according to Christendom's D-U-M-B, Christendom's uh, interpretation of this right here. So we need to look at this word and see if maybe there's something else here that we should be looking at. So we're going to scroll down. Um, an overseer then must, uh, coming on down, nope, that's not what I want, must be above reproach, the husband of one, right here, husband of one, uh, and this is, the word actually is Mia, okay? The word is Mia. Uh, it's, they, they write it up as heis, but Mia is actually a, a derivative of with different meaning than heis, okay? The word actually here is Mia, is one of these right here. So we're going to scroll down and take a look at... Uh, when they use haste, they use one, but actually in many, many cases of the Mia uses, um, it is not the cardinal number one. It's actually one in a series or one of a group. For example, um, Mia ton sabaton is one of the Sabbaths, okay, one of the Sabbaths, or it could be first. Okay, so the husband of one wife. One right here, the word Mia, uh, comes from the, the grouping of Hase. And here's what we want to look at. Um, I want you to notice, of course, there are a number of different words that are connected with this. But they're going to write right here, one A, okay, it can be translated as A, and then it's got some miscellaneous, and under miscellaneous, one of the things they don't show you right here is first, okay? So there are two other words that it can be translated as, as well as sometimes it gets translated as other, some, and in cases it's not even translated, okay? Some cases it's not even translated. So using our thinking cap here and recognizing that Moses probably qualifies as an elder in a congregation, and David, who is an author of scripture, certainly every congregation I know at one point or another reads his scriptures, uh, reads the Psalms, right? Uh, memorize the Psalms, right? Um, so all of those, it should immediately give us pause if there's something written here that says, oh, no, 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 David is not qualified to be an elder in some little congregation. Well, what if the word should have been translated A? got to be the husband of a wife, okay? Um, and we can talk about first, it's another one that's possible, or one in a series, one of several, 
right? It's, it is the way that that can be translated, at least as first. But what if this is translated as husband of a wife? It would make a whole lot of sense then when you read this, one who manages his household well. The point being that an overseer needs to be married doesn't matter whether he's got one or more. The point is he needs to be married so that he has a household to manage well and to demonstrate that he can keep his children under control with all dignity, right? Um, the fact that, that uh, this is being written to a, to a Greek society that is largely monogamous, saying one wife is actually redundant, uh, it's much more likely that he's saying married to a wife, okay? He has a wife, okay? Or he's, he's, got, he, he's married, right? He's got a family so he can manage his household well. I seriously doubt, I don't think it's, in, I, I don't think it's possible anywhere in Scripture to defend um, Paul changing the standards for an elder in Israel when an elder ever since the time of uh, before Noah, uh, an elder was free to have more than one wife. It was part of the deal in terms of being an elder in the gates. And it was part of the deal all the way through. God simply regulates. He never um, never spoke negatively, not a single word against. In fact, here's a good point. God re describes himself in five different places in Scripture as having more than one wife. Does that mean that he is not qualified to be an elder in that little congregation? That's a real good question. The bottom line is, is I think one in this circumstance is a horrible translation because it's actually translated through the monogamy only bias of the translators when that's not the bias of scripture. Scripture just says that a man is to be fruitful and multiply, right? And fill the earth. And fruitfulness and multiplication doesn't happen, particularly in our culture, very well with one wife. We're not even at the, at the replacement level uh, of, uh, of birth rate in this country at this point. Uh, Western civilization is collapsing because we don't even take care of the replacement level. And yet we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm, we got a problem here, okay? So this should be husband of a wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, um, one or, or one or a person who manages his household well, okay? And the same can be said for Titus, uh, Titus one, verse six. It's exactly the same thing. Titus one, verse six covers exactly the same thing. If a man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, okay? And that word there is Mia. Okay, it's right here. This is it right here. Mia, Gunekos, wife, right? Or Gune from Gune. Um, any man above reproach, the husband of, see right here, Mia, 1520s, exactly the same thing. Takes us to exactly the same place. Says exactly the same thing. Um, and the better translation would be a wife or as I said before, first wife, meaning he's a covenant keeper, he is still with the woman that he married in his youth, um, even if the fathers blessed him with more than one wife at that point. Now, the last passage that we want to look at is Matthew chapter uh, 19. Matthew 19, and we're specifically going to look at verses uh, 1 through 9. So when Yeshua finished these words, and this is the third spot that people like to go because they think this right here is just going to nail the coffin shut, right? Well, got news for you. When Yeshua had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of uh, Judea beyond the Yardan and called large crowds, follow, uh, large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Prishim, Pharisees, came to Yeshua testing him. Okay, so they're setting up a trick question, right? That's what we know they're doing when they're testing and asking, is it lawful for a man to, uh, the text here says divorce, many different versions say divorce his wife for any reason at all. But I've already given away the, um, the argument right here when I show you 
or highlight on the footnote that says send away. And I want you to understand, send away and divorce are two different Greek words. The actual Greek word behind this is the Greek word for send away. And that would be the equivalent of uh, separation in Western civilization. A lot of times before a, a divorce actually happens, there's a period of separation. And so she has been sent away or he has been sent out of the house, as it happens often in Western civilization, the crazy we have here. Um, and so there's a period of separation. Technically, they are still married. Okay, They are still married. They are not divorced. So the Pharisees are asking, is it lawful for a man to send away or separate his wife for any reason at all? And Yeshua, of course, answered, and he said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. All right, so Christendom wants to look at this, and they ignore the context at the beginning or the context that comes after this little segment of Scripture, and they'll just read verses 4 through 6. So Yeshua's answer to them, he doesn't say that whether it's lawful or not. He says, Have you not read what he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, the two shall become one flesh? Okay. Now, the word one right there doesn't mean singular one. Uh, in the in, in the original passage that he's citing from Genesis chapter 2. And we can go to that in just a minute. But Genesis chapter 2, it actually is a word that says echad flesh or uh, echad basar, which means they are united flesh. Okay, We know that they don't become singular one flesh because, well, she still gets up and does, you know, makes food, and he still goes out to the farm and takes care of the cows, and they're not one united flesh. They're separate, right? So the one flesh can mean a couple things, but the point that Yeshua is making is once the two have become united, they should not be torn apart. This does not, however, mean that a man cannot be united with more than one woman because we see very particularly that God created the circumstances. Go see my video on this. Created the circumstances for Jacob to have four wives. Does that mean he was only one flesh with Leah and then the rest of them were not? Does that mean six of the or seven of the 13 tribes are bastards or can a man be one flesh with more than one woman the point that yeshua is making is that you can't separate them and of course jacob never separated there are lots of laws in scripture that essentially say make it very hard for a man to separate from his woman okay uh or you know, women, each each relationship is a singular one flesh relationship because they continue and they say to him, why did Moses command her to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Notice this is two different pieces right here. Now they're quoting Moses correctly and they're citing directly from Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4. And in that passage, Divorce is a two, or some would say a three-step process. You're to write a certificate of divorce. Some would say put it in her hand is a secondary piece, um, or, or they'll, they'll group them in either that way or they'll group these two together. But write a certificate of divorce, put it in her hand, and send her away. Well, simply sending her away without a certificate of divorce, she is not divorced. She is still married. She's separated. That's the equivalent of being married. She still is. Uh, she still belongs to her, her husband. Okay. Deuteronomy clearly says that when she has the certificate of divorce and has been sent away, that then she can go marry another. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with it at that point. It's a tragic thing to tear apart what's been put together, 
And what God joins together, we don't want to tear apart. However, there are times when that happens. God himself gave a certificate of divorce and sent away the house of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 6 through 10. And it's affirmed again in Ezekiel chapter 23 that God has the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he divorced Israel, but he did not divorce Judah. Okay, so this passage right here, what uh, Yeshua specifically is pointing at, he's very specifically pointing not at the fact that you know, a, a monogamy only ideal. What he's specifically pointing at is the indissolubility of marriage. They can't be taken or they should not be taken apart. Let's put it that way. Should not be, be taken apart. Uh, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And that's the point that he's making. They ask him a stupid question and he gives them a, 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 an answer that doesn't doesn't play their game instead of debating whether or not divorce you know or what the merits of or or for what little bit or what how, how much offense she has to have to divorce her he simply says don't get divorced it's a bad idea that's not what god intended okay it's not a discussion about monogamy it's a discussion about the indissolubility of marriage that's really what's going on in this passage um, and of course you see, they continue to play with this down here, and the translations are confusing because they don't translate this properly. They'll give you the footnotes right here, right? He said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to send away your wives, but from the beginning it has not been. And I say, whoever sends away his wife except for immorality and marries another commits adultery. The point being that by sending her away without giving her a certificate of divorce, uh, you're dealing treacherously with her. Okay, which is exactly the terminology Yeshua uses in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. I hate sending away. He says you shouldn't deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. The point being that they were not releasing her to be covered by another. They shouldn't release her in the first place. They're, they're supposed to be taking care of her. Okay, and she's supposed to be operating in submission and walking with him the way he desires to operate his house. Okay, so a lot there to take in but those are that's that's the quick and dirty on uh, the three major passages um, we could go a lot of different places spider web out to a lot of different things from here but the primary purpose the first passage does not say one man one woman it says she belongs to him and uh, he owns her exclusively but it's also structured in such a way that he can have more than just her right um, the second one uh, should, if properly translated, would allow Moses and Abraham and Jacob and David to be elders in a small congregation, never mind the heads of Israel, progenitors of the faith, uh, patriarchs, the great, great men of old, right? And then the last passage there, if, uh, if we understand this properly, it's not about monogamy at all. It's about the indissolubility. It's not dissolvable, or it should not be dissolved. Let's put it that way, okay? The indissolubility of marriage. All right, guys. So I hope this is a quick video that covers all of that, uh, encapsulates that pretty quickly. There are lots of other places we could go, but this is enough material right here to be able to help people get a grip on uh, the fact that the New Testament never, ever changes anything from the Old uh, with regards to marriage. Uh, in the Old Testament, marriage was regulated. God allowed more than one woman. He just said, these are the guardrails. Don't step out of the guardrails. And the guardrails are spelled out in a few different passages. Okay. And he never changed it. So those continue to be exactly the same rules all the way through creation, all the way through history until now today. And I cover that on many of my other videos. Uh, absolutely, if you want more information, I recommend go check out some of my videos. I've got lots of them. I've got lots of response videos where I go into some of this in greater detail. There's a seven-part series about two years ago that I was responding to a couple guys who wanted to take me to task for what Scripture actually says. And I, I demonstrated multiple different ways with multiple different teachings um, and evidences from history evidences from the church fathers, evidences from uh, scripture, evidences from um, all kinds of different things to demonstrate that God's law hasn't changed, hasn't changed at all. 
and uh, what we teach or, or what Christendom teaches uh, called monogamy only is a fallacy. It's false. It's a lie. Um, and I will stand and I'll say that to anybody, anytime, anywhere. Uh, Pastor Dowell and I have a $20,000 challenge out there for anybody who wants to debate the topic um, that uh, basically says if you're willing to put the money up, we'll put the money up. And winner take all, um, the, the deal is to prove from Scripture alone that polygyny uh, a man having more than one wife is sin. And if you can do that, um, we're interested in talking to you. Uh, I don't think anybody can do that, and quite frankly, I'll be happy to take your money. Um, got a video on that, too. You have to scroll back through, and you'll find it. So, All right, guys. I uh, hope this helps you. Something beneficial that you can use moving forward. For King and Kingdom, I bid you shalom.